happy Sunday, First Legacy Church. Do you know what today is? It's our anniversary. And we have a wonderful guest pastor today. His name is Dr. Dennis Benton. And he came into First Legacy and preached a wonderful sermon about making a difference in the church and making a difference outside of the church. You do not want to miss it. We'll see you next week. The Bible says, wherefore? Comfort yourselves together and edify one another. Now catch this last part. Even as also you do. It's not something that you need to learn to do. It's something you need to continue to do. So let's pray. Father, I pray in these moments that you'd bless us, encourage us, and strengthen us that we may proclaim the word of God that every word that I say, God, would be filtered through the love of God, bathed in the blood of the Lord Jesus, and proclaimed through the divine Holy Spirit, that in this time, in this moment, in this hour, that, God, that we would in, be encouraged by your word, be strengthened by your word, be challenged by your word as you direct us in these moments, I pray. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Today, for just a moment, I want to talk to you about making a difference. In the life that you and I live, we live in the most chaotic society that we've ever lived in before. Things that you and I, for those of you who are my age and older, uh, have never faced before. Challenges in society that we never thought we would see. Families that seem to be on the edge every day of destruction. Circumstances that seem to drain us and situations that sap our energy and distract us and disturb us. Back in Genesis, there was a man named Joseph. Joseph who had a dream. And his dream was do that which God had called him to do. But his brothers hated him because his father showed favoritism on him. And because of that, he, just, he was sent down to send some food to his brothers. And while he was there, they had developed a plan to kill him. His brother Reuben stepped in and says, don't kill him. Let's throw him in a pit, and we'll decide what to do with him. So they threw him in a pit, and they left him there. While Reuben was away trying to make some other decisions, doing some other things, tending to the flock, the brothers saw, if you will, uh, some gypsies from Egypt coming by. And as these gypsies from Egypt came by, one brother said, well, let's not kill him. Let's get some out of him. Let's get some money off of him. And so what they did is they sold him into slavery. When Reuben came back, they had torn the coat, killed an animal, and put blood all over and said, now let's take it back to daddy and tell him that his precious son is now dead. Well, as he went on into uh, slavery, he was sold to Potiphar and at Potiphar's house, and he was a, a tremendous worker. He was skilled in what God had given him to do, had blessed him. He remained faithful in the midst of the circumstances, and even though in the midst of the circumstances, here Potiphar's wife said, you're a good-looking boy. He said, I, I want some of you, and he said, no, 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 you can't, and he ran off, and as he ran off, she grabbed a garment. Potiphar, so sad and upset, he had to send his best servant to jail. And while in jail, he prospered and he continued to be a difference maker because even there he was faithful. In, so what does that mean to us? It means in the midst of our circumstances, you got to remain faithful. There's going to be some times, there's going to be some issues, there's going to be some problems, there's going to be some things you're going to go, that's unfair, that's not right. I shouldn't be in this mess. But God says, stay faithful. Stay faithful. I've got a light at the end of the tunnel. I've got something that's for you, so hang in there with me, baby, because I'm going to reveal it here right shortly. So old Joseph's there in jail. So the cupbearer and the baker, they're there with him, and they have these dreams. And so Joseph says, I can interpret those dreams through the power of God. And he interprets the dreams for them. And they said, oh, how wonderful. When we get out of here, we'll remember you. Oh, yeah, sure they will. Yeah, sure they did. They didn't remember him. And so out they go. And then what happens is that one of them got thrown back into jail. And then he says, well, I'll remember you again. And still didn't remember him. But yet Joseph remained faithful because he was a difference. 
Beloved, not only did that transpire, then Pharaoh had a dream in Genesis chapter 25, and in that, Joseph then was called on the scene to answer his dream. And he answered his dream, and it was about a famine that was going to last. And so he put him in charge as the next to the prime minister. Finally, Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt. So all of that time, he remained faithful. How about you? Hmm? How about you? Have you remained faithful in the times that God has put situations in your life that he's called on you to be faithful? He's called on you to step up and, and stand up, and instead you just sit down and shut up. And God's called on you to do something. Well, let me tell you how to become a real difference maker. I got four little points. And, you know, we, we always got some point. Now, preachers, we learn, uh, Dr. Owens will tell you, preachers learn in school to have four points in a poem. Praise God, I ain't got no poem today, so I'm going to give you four points. Well, I got a poem. Okay, give you one little poem. All right. Uh, you know, uh, roses are red, violets are blue. You know, there you go. There's your poem for today. Um, I love you and, and you love you. So there you go. The first thing you have to understand is the Apostle Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica, he says, if you're going to be a difference in the lives of people, you have to have a genuine love for people that is recognizable. There's a lot of people that want to make a difference, but they want to be anonymous all the time. And that's not nothing wrong with that. But God is calling for you and for me to make a difference in lives of people that can be recognizable. That you, you can say, look, here is a place and a time and an hour and a moment and a date that I was able to make a difference in the life of someone. But you got to have a love for them, see? And there's a lot of people that want to make a difference, but they don't have a genuine love for their neighbor. So don't tell me to go uh, and be, go on a mission trip to, to Africa or to Indonesia or someone to win the lost when you won't go across the street and win your neighbor to the Christ Jesus. See, that's not a difference maker. Hey, it's, e it's easy to go on a mission trip somewhere where people don't know you. People don't know about you. People don't know the, who you really are, and you can go and, and pretend and, and then you get back home and your neighbor says, well, how come you ain't ever come up and talk to me about Jesus? Amen. Now I'm telling you, you got to have a recognizable love that is genuine and make a difference in people's lives. I have the privilege right now. My young associate pastor, 35 years old, a year ago in November, he was called into the ministry. God called him to preach. But the church he was attending... The pastor resigned two weeks later. It was a church start, and about a month later, the church had gone out of business, if you will. So here this young 35-year-old called to the preach preacher had nobody to teach him how to preach. So he called me. Well, let me give you a little big background real quick on that. 21 years ago, he was a teenager in the youth group where I was the pastor. And I led him to the Lord and baptized this young man. Now, fast forward 21 years later, now he's 35 years old, married with three children of his own. God's called him to preach. Now, I could have done one or two things. I said, good luck. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad God called you. I was hoping we could get another preacher to preach the gospel. But praise God, good luck. Hope you're the best for you. Let me pray for you. No, I didn't pray for him. I didn't only pray for him. He, he preached last Sunday in my church while I was somewhere else because we're training him and encouraging him. And one of these days, this old boy is going to lay her down. Now, I won't ever quit preaching, but I might quit pastoring that church. And when I do, he'll step right behind the desk and go right on for the glory of God. Why? Because a recognizable, genuine love for someone that will make a difference in somebody's life. 
I love it. A word of encouragement won't kill you. A smile on your face won't kill you. A handshake won't kill you. A pat on the back won't kill you. We need some proof in the pudding, baby. That's what we need. We need somebody to stand up and say, I will have a genuine love for people that's recognizable. That's exactly right. The second thing Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica, he says, not only must you have a love for people that is genuine, you got to have a passion and a desire to action. Yeah, you got to have a passion to action. One of the things we have over in the white church, which is a little unusual in the black church, is that we have so many committees to have a committee, to have a committee on committees. So what we do is we form us a committee, and that committee begins to talk about it. And then that committee forms a committee to talk about that. And then that committee has a committee who talks about what that committee was talking about before that committee got a hold of it. And then what we dumbly did is we decided to have a committee over the committees. And I thought, well, glory to God, who's going to do any work? So down at the little Northdale Baptist Church where I'm the pastor, we streamlined all that stuff. When I went there five and a half years ago, I didn't even go there to be the pastor. I just stopped by for three Sundays to preach for them. And them people are crazy. They have to be. I'm still there. I mean, let's be truthful. I stopped by, and the first Sunday I was there, I was the supply preacher. I said, well, that ain't no bad. You know, I'm only going to be here three weeks, so I can be the supply preacher. So I, I, um, I left and went and did a revival up in uh, Asheboro, North Carolina. I came back on the third Sunday, and in the bulletin it had uh, Dr. Dennis Benton, interim pastor. I said, say it ain't so. I'm the interim pastor? Hmm. Okay, well, I'm only be here three weeks, so I guess interim, that's interim. Sure, no problem, okay. Yeah. Well, then I left and went and preached another revival, and I came back from that on the fifth Sunday, and it had in there Dr. Dennis Ben Pastor. I said, what about this now? So I called my little deacons together. There are only five of them, and they're all over the age of 70 years old. Say glory to God on that. Amen. Isn't that good? So them boys got some wisdom now, so I bring, I don't know if they had much wisdom, but they had some. So I brought all them boys together, and I said, look here, boys, I need to talk to you about this here. I said, I've gone from supply pastor to interim pastor to the pastor. I never wanted to be any of it. And they said, well, let me ask you something. I said, all right, go ahead. They said, do you like us? I said, yeah, I like you just fine. They said, well, we like you too. They said, why don't you stay until you quit liking us? Five and a half years later, I'm still there. I must love them now. I done quit liking them, amen. So, But we streamline a few things. See, I don't have a deacon's meeting, but whenever we need to have a deacon's meeting. Back at church I used to pastor, we had one every single month, and we just sat there and looked at each other. I said, well, we got to talk about it. nothing. Well, what are we doing here? Well, we got to have a deacon's meeting. I said, well, if we ain't got nothing to talk about, let's go home. Basketball game's on. I mean, come on. I'd rather watch Duke basketball than I'd ever like to sit there and watch the Deacons. I mean, now I know some of you Carolina fans, and God will bless you for it, maybe, but I don't know. Praise the Lord. Everybody can't be a Duke, Duke basketball fan. Praise God. Only a select few get to be. Never mind. I've done going off the... <laughs> Done gone off the reservation now, praise God. Let's get back to the message here. But anyway, so I went to this church, and I had to help them understand that we've got to have a passion and a desire to action. Because you can talk and talk and talk and talk, and nothing ever gets done. Ever gets done. You know what it's time for? It's time to quit talking. It's time to start doing well, y'all right down here in the heart of the city. There's a lot of lost people in these, these homes around here that are going to hell today. You said, you said hell, preacher. Well, I might as well. Jesus said it more times than I'll ever think it. Because people are going to hell. They, I know the Pope said there ain't no hell. I know Robert Schuller said one time that, that hell's just a place that God uses to scare people to, to uh, go to heaven. 
But I want you to know there is a place called hell that one day those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior will spend eternity. There'll be the weeping and gnashing of teeth. The smoke will go up forever and ever, and there'll never be a return. So I don't want anybody to go. So if I don't want anybody to go, I got to do something besides talk about it. I got to do something besides think about it. I got to do something besides wonder about it. I got to put some passion into the action and do something to make a difference in the lives of people. Amen. Beloved, we got to make a difference. You think this church started just so Dr. Etheridge would have something to do? I mean, come on. I've known him a long time. He's been in the school system almost 30 years. 20 years here and more. And, and, and he went and got education. He didn't get an education so he could play tiddlywinks all the rest of his life, honey. He did it because God called him. You people don't come to this church on Sunday just so you can sing a couple of songs, hear a good little story, and go out of here and say, that's nice. That's nice. Maybe we can go back and get another servant of that next week. No. You come here for a purpose. You come here to get energized. You come here to get refueled. Your power lit back up so you can get out of this place and go and share the gospel with somebody. But you know what? Too many people will sit on the sideline. See, God's not calling for any more spectators. He's calling for participators. God don't need any more pew sitters. He might could use a few pew jumpers, amen? But he needs somebody that's willing to stand up with a passionate desire to action. Action. You know, the old, old uh, adage says, action speaks louder than... Let me hear it. Action speaks what? Well, if it does, then what are we going to do about it? Action. God's called you into action. You said, well, he just saved my soul. Yeah, he saved your soul, but he put you in the army ready to go. See, when you invite Jesus in your heart, not only you get saved for eternity, but you enlist in God's army. And when you enlist in God's army, God's army never knows retreat. It only knows offense. It don't know defense. It knows how to head forward, not backwards. And so when it knows how to go forward, you got to go forward with him. God says, get up. Get up and go. I'll tell you something. There was a little boy. It's just a little boy. He's 12 years old. And this little boy, he went to church. And uh, he went into children's church one Sunday morning, and a man named Bob Curry walked up beside him. And he said, uh, Son, he said, Would you like to invite Jesus in your heart? And he said, Well, I don't know about this week. He said, Maybe another time. Well, the very next Sunday, when they finished the preaching in the children's church, they had the invitation, and Mr. Curry went over to that little boy. He said, little boy, he said, would you like to invite Jesus in your heart? He said, yes, sir, but I don't know how. He said, well, if you'll get down here right beside this old metal chair with me, I'll walk you the Roman road to get you there. And oh, Mr. Curry took that Bible, and he walked that little boy from Romans 6.23 to Romans 10.23 to Romans 10.13 to Romans 10, 9 and 10. And he said, now if you'll pray and by faith believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and paid the penalty for your sin on the third day was resurrected, uh, taken and destroying death, hell, and the grave. And if you believe that and you pray in faith, Jesus will save your soul. And I want you to know, 43 years ago, I was that little boy. I was that little boy. Yeah, I was that little boy. But I want you to know something. What if Mr. Curry had decided that he didn't have a passionate desire to action? That after the first Sunday he came and he said, little boy, do you want to know Jesus? And I said, I don't know. Not today. Come back another time. And what if Bob Curry said, I'm not coming back another time. You got your only chance, son. If it ain't today, it ain't no time. 
and walked away, you know where I'd be today? I'd either be in jail or out on bail or on my way to hell. And if Bob Curry hadn't had the sense to have prayed with me and invited me, then I might be lost for eternity. But beloved, it takes a passionate desire for action. Thirdly, and give you this quickly, we've got to have an overwhelming joy to serve. Look what the Bible says here, what we just read in your hearing. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. In another translation, it says, even as also you are now doing. If you're now doing it, hey, we got to do it with joy. There's too many sad, frown, out of heart faced Christians in the world today. We don't need any more. People look like they supped on a lemon or ate a plate full of briars before they came somewhere. You see them at work and they look like they got beat up the night before and they ain't got beat up. They just hadn't showed up where they ought to be. They ain't prayed up. They ain't read the Bible in so long they got dust on it that they draw rings in it. It sits in the back of their car. It goes from Sunday morning to the back of the car. And some Bibles are faded because it's been sitting in the sunlight from Sunday to Sunday. And then you say, oh, by the way, I better pull that out. Preacher might use that day. Amen. <laughs> he might use it. Amen. I'm telling you. And then, then we don't know. We go, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. But we got to do it with joy. I mean, after all, the Bible says that with joy, Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross with joy. Who, who would go to a cross knowing you're going to die and pay the penalty for the sins of every human being that ever lived with joy? But he went with joy. Why did he go with such joy? He had overwhelming joy because he was willing to serve. He went for me and you. Oh, beloved, today we've got to have an overwhelming joy to serve. There's fun in service. It ain't easy. They sometimes it's not easy. Your pastor and I were talking in the back earlier before we came out. You know, when that 2.30 in the morning phone call comes and Miss Marty is on her way to the hospital and just had a heart attack and they call and say, Preacher, can you come? You say, well, I don't know. I don't start till 9 o'clock. So you think Miss Marty can hang on till 9 in the morning? If she can hang on till 9, I'll be there. If not... Put her on ice until I arrive. Oh, no. Man, I tell you, I've been woke up at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, whatever, during the night. And they said, Pastor, so-and-so's on their way to the hospital. Can you come? I said, if you'll give me time just to figure out where my glasses and my keys on, I'll be there in a few minutes. I learned a long time ago, people are not interested in my five-point series on grace. They're worried about whether I'm standing there or not. They don't care all the great sermons I've ever preached. They don't care how good a preacher I am. They care how good a pastor I am. And when you're a good pastor, you have an overwhelming joy to serve. And as the people of God, we must have an overwhelming, overwhelming joy in serving the Lord. Beloved, in just a few minutes... Over yonder, not too far from where we are, 72 plus thousand people will run in that stadium. Paid 25 to to $1,000 a seat so they can go see a bunch of people they don't know run up and down a football field. And I guarantee you after that ball game, now I love the Panthers as much as anybody in this room. But I want you to know none of them have ever been over to my house for dinner. Praise God, and none of them have ever invited me over to their house for dinner. So you, they're going to get over there, and they're going to yell, and they're going to holler, and they're going to shout, and they're going to say, woo-hoo, if, if, uh, if somebody runs in for a touchdown, and if Jacksonville runs in for a touchdown, all the people from Jacksonville, they'll hoot and holler and act a fool too, and all of them, and then when the game is over, they'll all go home. Well, hear me now with reason for that, because their joy is over. Their joy is over. But, beloved, when you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, your joy is just beginning. It ain't a temporal thing. So I want you to know we've got to have an overwhelming joy to serve. You say, well, I'm, I'm too old. No, you're not too old. You're still breathing, ain't you? Folks, I've got folks in my little church up the street that's 93 years old. 
that's 91 years old, that's 89 years old, and they're still busy serving. You say, what are they doing? I said, they're doing more now than they've ever done. We have a, a homeless shelter box. It's a big tub about like this. Big, giant, rubber-made tub. And we fill it beginning in the month of September with socks, white tube socks. And it's going to go on Monday to the homeless shelter. You say, well, what in the world did you do that for? The biggest need at the men's homeless shelter is white socks, tube socks, athletic socks. That's something they need bad. And so my little folks who are 80 and 90 years old, some of them, they can't do what they used to do, but they can do more than they're going to do. Praise God, what are they doing? They bring in socks. They said, Preacher, Preacher, I went to Walmart today, and I got three packs of white socks. I said, that's service. I said, because it's going to go from the Walmart hand to your hand, from that hand into that box, from that box down to the homeless shelter, from the homeless shelter to the person who gives them out, from that person to the person that needs them, and there is a joy. Just think, one of these days in heaven, Glory to God. One of these days in heaven, here's going to come on some old boy down the streets of gold, and he's going to walk up to me or you, and he's going to look in our face in, and he's going to say, look, you had an overwhelming desire to serve, and because of you and because of the socks that you gave, put in that little box, or maybe the word of encouragement you gave, or maybe the pat on the back that you gave, or whatever you did for God's glory, hallelujah, I'm here today, and I wouldn't have been if not. Hey, every little thing you and I do, if we do it in Jesus' name, when we do it for Jesus, oh, my friends, the last thing I want to tell you, now the preacher said I could preach as long as I wanted, but y'all usually left about a few minutes after 10. He showed me how to turn off the lights and lock the door, but, uh, but praise God, that's okay. I want to give you one little nook, more nugget before we close here. We've got to make a difference. We've got to have a purpose. We've got to have a power. And we've got to pray. Now, see, there's a lot of us have a purpose. We have a desire to do something. Then some of us forget about the power. See, the power ain't in me. I never want to be a preacher. Never. Never. Every preacher I knew was fat and bald-headed. Don't be looking at my head. Don't be looking up here. It's not all gone yet, but it's getting close. I wanted to be a professional baseball player. And I studied it. I mean, I've got, at my house, I have close to 2 million baseball cards from the early 1970s till 1997. I could hit like them, stand like them, run like them, act like them. I, I played in my own front yard by myself. I was going to be a professional baseball player. And then God said, no, you're not. God said, I want you to, to go into ministry. I want you to preach. And I said, well, God, I don't want to preach. So one Saturday afternoon in Indian Trail, North Carolina, I was down on the mound pitching, and I got up and I threw. And, man, I was having the best ball game I'd ever had in my life, preacher. I'm telling you, they had this boy, he's as big as I am then. I mean, he's a big old boy. He had knocked everybody in the, in the league over the fence. I said, you ain't going to hit me over the fence. You might not even got a hit. But praise God, you, you might hit it, but you ain't going to knock me over the fence. I was mean then. I'm mean now. What are you talking about? I was mean then. Man, I got up and I wound up and I threw the best, fastest fastball I could right at his head. Yes, I did. And that old boy, he just looked down on the ground like, stuck that bat like, I'm going to get you now. I was like, yes, sure you are. Next three pitches were nice, slow curveballs. They broke right at his head and right over the plate. He about wound himself in the ground trying to get out of the way. Strike three. See, I said, man, I'm good, God. I'm good. Don't you know I'm good? I done took care of the Goliath of baseball right here. The next pitch I threw, I found a, felt a little twinge right here in my side. I completed one more inning of baseball. That's it. 
because I felt a jab in my side. And what I'd done is I separated two ribs. And the doctor told me if I'd thrown one more pitch, one more pitch, my rib would have broken, stuck me in the lung, and, I, and killed me right there on the ball field. I said, God, I think you got my attention now. I'll preach. See, I, 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 I'm not a good preacher. I know that. But God's a good preacher. See, I don't have to do all the work. He does the work. I just read his word and tell you what he's got to say. I ain't ever going to have my TV show. I ain't going to have no big ball behind me. I ain't going to have 150,000 people watching me on TV or 10,000 people sitting in the audience, but you know, that don't bother me. My audience is upward, not outward. That's where my power comes from. See, I'm not plugged into the wall, baby. I'm plugged into eternity. I'm plugged into heaven. I'm plugged into God's grace. And how do I do that? Let me tell you, here you go. I do that by prayer. If I want to make a difference in life, I got to pray and ask God what he wants me to do. And when God gives me what he wants me to do, he wants me to have a passionate desire to action. He wants me to have an overwhelming joy to serve. He wants me to have a genuine love for people that's recognizable. Hey, we got too many Lone Ranger Christians. We got too many in the shadows and in the dark and in the back who says, I want to do a little something, but I don't want anybody to know. And God says, step out front so so many will know. You can only do so much from behind. You got to do a few from the front. You say, well, preacher, I can't preach. God ain't calling all of you to preach. But God is calling all of you to minister. In the... mm -hmm. Now let me close with these three little questions here to you. You want to make a difference in the life of people? If you do, what are people going to say about your life when you're gone? What are they going to say? Well, they wanted to make a difference, but you know they just didn't ever have the time. Well, they wanted to make a difference, but they just didn't have the energy. Well, they wanted to make a difference, but they never cared enough to make one. They wanted to make a difference, but they decided to sit on the sideline instead of getting the game. What will they say about your life? The second is, is are you a difference maker or are you just indifferent? Mm-hmm. Are you? Are you a difference maker or are you just indifferent? And finally, I won't ask you. Because the proof's in the pudding, honey. It is. The proof is in the pudding. What will you do to make a difference in the life of somebody today? Are you going to make them better or are you going to make them bitter? What you going to do? That's the question. If you want to make a difference, the proof's in the pudding. You're either going to or you're not. You say, well, look, preacher, man, you're going back to your church. Well, we care. Well, you're here, aren't you? You came for some reason. You came from some word. And God said, bring you that word, so that's the one I brought you. Now, the question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Now, I don't know how you close out church here, but let me tell you how we close up down the street. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask your pastor to come right here, and I'm going to ask your keyboardists to start playing a little tune of some kind. And I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to ask you to stand all over this building. And as I pray, and you stand in, in a, just a second, I'm going to invite you. I'm going to invite you. Because I've never seen anybody do anything for Jesus. They didn't come to Jesus to ask him how to do it. And I'm going to invite you to get up from wherever you are. And I'm going to ask you to come and stand around the front of this building right here. And say, God, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. Now, if you don't want to make a difference, I'm, I'm not trying to arm twist you, brow beat you, uh, point you out. I can't even see you. I mean, praise God, all these lights up here, I could land an airplane up here, praise God. But I can't see you, so I don't know what you're doing. So if you don't get up and come forward, that's, I won't be able to know. But God will know. 
And then your pastor's going to be right here. Uh, Dr. Etheridge will be here to pray for you and with you. And, and you say, well, I don't know how. Well, that's okay. They got God's man here to help you. You say, well, well, what if there's too many there? That's all right. Dr. Owens is back there. He knows how to pray. He's done it a time or two himself. Yeah, and many others of you are here. Our brother's right over here. He'll step right up and pray with you. Yeah, he will. Some of the sisters will step up and pray with you too. But the question is, is if you want to make a difference, the proof's in the pudding. It is. You've got to make a tangible step towards God and say, God, I want to make a difference in the lives of people that you have allowed me to have influence with and influence around for your kingdom's glory. And as we launch together here on this first anniversary, that years down the road, this room, not only years but weeks down the road, this room will be too small. Be too small because you're making a difference. It's kind of like that old uh, shampoo commercial. You know, they said they told one about it. And then they told another about it. And then they told another about it. And then all of a sudden, everybody's using that shampoo. Well, glory to God, if shampoo's that important, don't you think Jesus is a little more? So if you'll tell one, and somebody else will tell one, and somebody else will tell one, before long, you won't need this room. Praise God, you'll need the one over there where they're playing soccer right now. And you'll do that for the glory of God. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus today. Thank you for the privilege that's been mine to share a little word. I pray, God, that every word that we've said. Had been